All right, everyone, this is lecture 5-2. Here we're talking about the structure and organization of muscles as well as parts of their function, including their, um, their excitability and contraction, as well as the neuromuscular junction. So muscles are organized uh, and encased by connective tissue. So as we get from the larger structure, the, the belly of the muscle, it is encased in epimysium, which is a continuation of the tendon that attaches that muscle to a bone. When we look inside the epimysium, we will see that the muscle belly is composed of individual fascicles. An individual fascicle is surrounded by a paramysium, and that paramysium is uh, an invagination of that same connective tissue, epimysium. It's continuous with the par paramysium to encase individual fascicles. Individual fascicles uh, within the muscles are composed of a number of muscle fibers which are surrounded by endomysium. A muscle fiber is another word for a single muscle cell or a myocyte. So all of the functional components of the cell are inside that muscle fiber and multiple muscle fibers make up a muscle fascicle. So when we look at a cross-section of skeletal muscle under the microscope, we can see those individual structures. We can see individual muscle cells bundled together, uh, surrounded by endomysium and bundled together to form a fascicle. Separating individual fascicles, we have the paramysium and around an entire muscle belly, we will have the epimysium. <clears throat> So as we get down into an even smaller subcellular level, we're gonna talk about the internal components uh, that give the structure and function to a muscle cell and allow it to contract. So within a muscle cell itself, a myocyte, also known as a muscle fiber, you will have multiple myofibrils. Myofibrils are the contractive elements of a cell uh, that are bundled together uh, and within a muscle fibril are the myofilaments. Those myofilaments form the uh, contractile molecular protein apparatus that gives the uh, contractility, uh, contractibility of the myocyte. Surrounding all of the myofibrils, between all of them, is the sarcolemma, which is just another name for the um, endoplasmic reticulum of a muscle cell. So the, uh, or the uh, sarcoplasm. So the sarcoplasm is the endoplasmic reticulum. The sarcolemma is the plasma lemma, which is the internal components. So the sarcoplasm uh, is analogous to, it is functionally the same thing as the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is critical in muscle cells because it sequesters calcium. And calcium is a, a component, a, a necessary ion uh, that triggers the muscle contraction as we will see physiologically. <clears throat> so uh, the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasm has a very distinct shape within a muscle cell, unlike other cells of the body. The uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum is arranged uh, around and between all of those myofibrils, but at the end of those, um, uh, the portions, the long spidery portions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, what you'll see are the terminal cisternae. These terminal cisternae are bundled in pairs on either side of what's called a transverse tubule. A transverse tubule is an invagination of the uh, plasma membrane, the outside of the cell, an invagination of that uh, that goes deep inside and around the uh, muscle fibers within the, uh, or the muscle filament, uh, filaments within the myocyte. This is important because the action potential always runs along the uh, plasma membrane, always runs along the external, of a, the external uh, border of a cell. And so to have these 
uh, transverse tubules invaginating into the cell, it allows that action potential formed at the neuromuscular junction at the synapse to transfer deep within the cell. Uh, this allows that action potential to very quickly trigger the release of calcium in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, causing contraction throughout the cell very rapidly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we take a closer look at uh, the filaments uh, within these myofibrils, what we'll see is uh, that they're composed of many different types of, of filaments. Thin and thick filaments are the two main components. These thin and thick filaments uh, form individual contractile units called sarcomeres. So these sarcomeres are the fundamental element and the smallest uh, element of the contractility of a myocyte. Uh, so this is what a sarcomere looks like uh, under an electron microscope. And the sarcomere is the area between uh, two Z lines. So we can see one Z line here, one Z line here. The darker region in the middle uh, is called the A band. Uh, it's called the A-band because it's anisotropic uh, in uh, microscopic views, whereas the I-band is isotropic uh, in, uh, the, in a microscope, in an optical microscope. Uh, but the composition of these different bands changes. So the, uh, the I-band is composed only of these thin filaments. Thin filaments are the actin uh, that we're all familiar with. The thick filaments uh, compose a portion of the A-band, but overlapping with those uh, thick filaments, we will find some of the thin filaments as well, the actin. Uh, so you have uh, an H zone here where the uh, thin and thick filaments are interacting, the myosin and actin are interacting. As a sarcomere contracts, uh, then the width of the A band will shrink, or the I band will shrink. The A band always stays the same size because the A band is the full length of the uh, myosin. So neither the, the uh, thin filaments or thick filaments actually change in length. They're just sliding over top of each other during contraction. And what ha So here you can see the relaxed and the contracted uh, state. So what happens uh, during contraction is that these uh, the heads of the myosin are uh, going to uh, undergo conformational change with the hydrolysis of ATP. And uh, those heads are going to actually grab onto the uh, actin thin filaments and move along their length uh, by continually grabbing uh, flexing, grabbing, flexing to move along their length. Uh, the actual uh, hydrolysis of ATP, so when ATP um, binds to the myosin head, it will actually cause the myosin head to release. And the uh, consumption, the hydrolysis of ATP, is going to cause the recocking of that myosin head into its open orientation. So the consumption of ATP isn't, uh, doesn't occur in the pulling, it occurs in the release and the cocking of the myosin. <clears throat> so this is interesting physiology. I just wanna reinforce this physiology as we're talking about muscles and skeletal muscles. What happens, so over here on the left, we see a transverse tubule. Here on the right, we see one of the terminal cisternae of the endoplasmic reticulum loaded with calcium ions. <clears throat> so when that action potential, uh, shown here by this little red area and the pluses and minuses, when it reaches down into the end of the T-tubule, uh, it will cause a conformational change in, a, uh, in an ion channel that's physically connected to the endoplasmic reticulum. So that ion channel will open uh, a, a channel in the endoplasmic reticulum causing the release of calcium uh, into uh, the region of the myofilaments. <clears throat> that calcium will bind to the troponin molecule, which is taking up binding sites uh, 
uh, on the uh, actin filaments along with the tropomyosin coil around the actin filaments. So that, uh, that calcium binding to the troponin will cause a conformational change which will move the tropomyosin away from the binding sites on actin. That will allow for a longer power stroke of stronger binding uh, between the myosin head and the actin filaments. So that's why calcium is critical in these uh, muscle contractions. We can see here there is a maximal range for where those uh, contractions take place. So if you over contract, then the strength of that contraction weakens because you're just overlapping the actin filaments. You don't get more binding sites, you actually get fewer binding sites. So in that way, the tension of the sarcomere decreases as contraction increases because fewer binding sites are present. Similarly, if you over loose, if you get too loose, if the length of the sarcomere increases beyond the overlap point, then the myosin can no longer bind to the actin because they're completely separated and that tension decreases also. So you have this small normal range at which skeletal muscle optimally contracts. <clears throat> so here you can see uh, uh, an electron micrograph of these sarcomeres within a muscle cell. So this is the longitudinal view of these uh, sarcomeres. You can see the Z-lines here. You can also see the uh, terminal cisternae and the T-tubules. The T-tubules always line up with the Z-line within the sarcomeres. That maximizes the release of calcium and maximizes the tension in these sarcomeres. Another important concept to understand is the concept of the um, the motor units or the uh, motor neuron units. So one, uh, one lower motor neuron is going to synapse on, form neuromuscular junctions with multiple muscle fibers. And I mentioned this in a previous lecture, but the uh, more muscle fibers uh, that one neuron innervates, the less control you have over the strength of the contraction of that muscle. If one neuron is controlling a quarter of the um, motor fibers, uh, muscle fibers, for instance, in a muscle, then you can only do quarter strength intervals. You're only at quarter strength, half strength, three quarter strength, or 100% one, strength. But if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, one muscle fiber per one lower motor neuron, then you can control in ex extremely fine detail how much force you want to exert with that muscle. So for instance, muscles in the mouth and the lips, the fingers, those uh, have a very low motor neuron unit uh, ratio, which means that you have fine control over those movements. But muscles of the back or of the legs, uh, the, the quadriceps, you have a higher motor neuron unit uh, number. So uh, now let's take a look at the neuromuscular junction itself. This is a, uh, an optical light microscopic view of muscle fibers in the longitudinal orientation. Uh, so you can see here this axon coming in and giving off multiple collaterals to form synapses on many different uh, muscle fibers. So this one axon, we can see it synapsing on one, two, uh, three, four, five, and there's probably a sixth one off, off uh, field here. Uh, so that would give you a six to one motor neuron unit ratio. <clears throat> so a little clinical correlate here, um, the um, amyloid lateral sclerosis is uh, caused by the damage to upper and lower motor neurons. So as these neurons lose their uh, Schwann cells or their oligodendrocytes, that are ensheathing them, then uh, the neurons become susceptible to damage and they end up dying off. Um, and of course, as the oligodendrocyte is um, no longer ensheathing that neuron, the neuron can't fire as efficiently. So here we see an example of uh, ALS with upper motor neuron lesions. We can see this lighter region in the MRI here, uh, which indicates 
calcification of the upper motor neuron tracts as it's coming from the primary motor cortex through the internal capsule uh, of the brain down to form the uh, corticospinal tracts. Uh, so that's an example of a motor neuron disease. All right, thanks for listening.